Hey, what is up everybody? It's Alex Booker here again from CodeCast. In the previous screencast, we defined a simple model in order to demonstrate SQLite in action. Whilst I think that starting with such a simple model was good for demonstration purposes, in real applications, you'll likely find yourself wanting to customize your models further. For example, you might want to specify default values and validation rules for your model properties, or you might want to specify a custom primary key, among other things. In this screencast, I'm going to teach you how to gain more control over your SQLized models through customization. All right, let's get started. To reiterate something that I covered in the previous screencast, we define SQLized models using this define function. We pass to this define function two arguments. First, we pass the name of the model, which in this case is article. Then we pass the model properties. Each of the model properties have a corresponding value, which is the property's data type. In this case, we're saying that the title property's data type is string and that the body's data type is text, or at least it should be. Sorry about that, guys. Understand though that what you're looking at here is essentially a shortcut. There's actually a lengthier, but it's also more extensible syntax for declaring model properties which I'll demonstrate to you now by rewriting the body property of the article model. First, we write the name of the property, body, followed by a semicolon, just like before. But instead of associating the data type with the property directly, we're instead going to associate a JavaScript object literal, and on that object literal, define a property called type, whose value is the property's data type. Again, the body's data type is going to be text. As you can see, we now have two properties called body. These two properties are, at the moment, practically identical. It's just that this code is more explicit and therefore longer. It doesn't really make sense, by the way, to be defining this property twice, so I'm going to remove the shorter version now. You might be wondering at this point why you might want to use this longer syntax. Well, for one thing, the code is now self-documenting and therefore a little bit more readable. Another benefit of this syntax is that it is extensible. What do I mean by extensible? Well, in addition to the type of the property, we can, for example, specify a default value. In the case of this body property, I'll set the default value to be the text coming soon. Now, if no body value is specified when inserting an article, SQLite will assume the default value coming soon. Like I said, this syntax is more extensible in addition to the type, you can also specify additional attributes like a default value. Type and default value aren't the only attributes you can specify for a model property. Here, I'll show you some more options, this time on the title property. First of all, we need to refactor the title property code to use the longer syntax. I think that the title property ought to be unique because it could potentially be confusing to a user if there are multiple articles with the exact same title. To ensure that each article has a unique title, we can set the unique attribute to true, like this. Now, if you attempt to insert an article with a duplicate title, SQLize will reject the insertion and throw an error. You can then handle that error and render it to your user. And by the way, in a future video, I'll teach you how to gracefully handle SQLize errors. Another thing to consider with regards to this title property is what should happen if the title is missing. In the case of the body property, if no value is specified, SQLize will assume a default value per this default value property. However, I don't think it makes sense for the title to have a default value. Instead, I think the title should be a required field. Thus, that if we attempt to insert an article with no title, SQLize will throw an error. To make the title property required, we can simply set the allow null property to false, like that. It's possible that you might find the property name allow null to be a little bit cryptic. Surely this option should be called something like required. Well, you can think of the word null as meaning no data and therefore read this property as allow no data. It's not the most eloquent property name, but it does make sense. Next, let's look at how to prevent SQLize from automatically creating timestamp columns 
for our database tables. Just in case you don't remember what I'm talking about, allow me to refresh your memory by going to Workbench and executing a simple query against the articles table. As you can see, in addition to the title and body fields, which result directly from our title and body properties, SQLite has also created an ID column for us, as well as a couple of timestamp columns, which signify when the record was created and when it was last updated. Even though these timestamp columns are desirable for most database tables, you may, for whatever reason, wish to disable them, and I'm going to show you how. To disable these timestamp columns, we simply need to pass a third argument to the define function, and on that argument, specify the timestamps property and set it to false. You can think about this third argument as a sort of options object on which you can define additional options for the model. Here, we're disabling the timestamps option, but of course, there are additional options you can specify. I'm not going to go into any great detail, but just to give an example, there is a freeze table name property, which when set to true, prevents SQLite from automatically pluralizing the table name. You might have noticed that in our code, we called our model and by extension, our table article. And yet if we look at the database, you can see that the table is actually called articles. That's because SQLite automatically pluralized the model name. I actually favored this behavior, so I'm going to remove that option, but it just goes to show that there are a few options you can specify. Before running this code, I'll open Workbench to show you that the table still has those timestamp columns. As you can see, if I run the query again, those timestamp columns still exist. Note as well that we are still calling the sync function, which I described in the previous screencast as a function that creates a corresponding table in the database for the model. All right, let's run this code and see what happens. As you can see, I'm getting an error, which reads column body can't have a default value. I happen to know that this error happens only on Windows when you try and associate a default value with a property that has the data type sqlize.txt. There is an elaborate workaround available that I found on Stack Overflow. As you can see, here are some instructions on how to solve this problem. However, due to the fact that this is a little bit off topic, I'm going to employ a much more temporary workaround, which is simply to disable the default value. I'm sorry about that, but it's surely better than me going through that tutorial. Let's quit out of this now and run the script again, and hopefully now we won't have any errors. Okay, this time the code ran without any errors. You might expect now that if I return to Workbench and refresh the table, that the timestamp columns would have been deleted, but as you can see, that's not the case. Well, why? Simply put, for the most part, you cannot update tables using the sync function. The sync function only creates tables if they do not already exist. It can't update the tables or their columns attributes. So when you call the sync function in this context, SQLize effectively looks at the database and says, well, hold on a second. There's already a table with the name articles. I'm not going to interfere with that because the consequences of my interfering could be catastrophic. So you know what, I'm gonna do nothing. And therefore, when we refresh the table, despite the fact that we updated our model, no changes have taken effect. This might all seem a bit counterintuitive at first, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Looking at the table again, we can see that for each row in the table, there are timestamps associated with them. Deleting the timestamp columns would have to result in the timestamps themselves being deleted. This may or may not be what you intended to do. In fact, there are a handful of ways you could handle a scenario like this, but SQLite couldn't possibly know which and therefore chooses to make a conservative assumption that you do not want to delete this data rather than potentially being quite destructive. In order for the changes we've made in this screencast to actually take effect, we're going to need to forcibly recreate the articles table. That means deleting the articles table and then creating it again using that same sync function. Understand and listen carefully that by deleting the table, we will also be deleting all of its data. This is fine for my demo and will most likely be fine for you during development. However, it's clearly unsuitable for databases that are already in production. In a future video, I'm gonna talk more about how to update tables that are in production using a process called data migration. 
Now, though, I will simply show you how to forcibly recreate the articles table using SQLize. To force the latest changes to take effect, all you need to do is pass an object as an argument to this sync function and on that object set the force property to true. Just to be abundantly clear, setting the force option to true will potentially delete all of the data from your database. So take due care not to run this code against your production database. Before running this code, let me quickly enable logging so we can see what's happening behind the scenes. Looking at the generated SQL, we can see that SQLize firstly drops the table before recreating it. Now, when we analyze the table in Workbench, the timestamp columns, as well as all of the data, are gone. What's more, if I go down to the little schema view here and click on the settings icon next to the articles table, I can see that the title has a not null checkbox checked and a unique checkbox checked. This reflects the attributes we specified for the title property earlier in the video. Had we managed to get the default value for the body field to work, we would see that default value here. One last thing I'll show you in this screencast is how to create a custom primary key for your models. As you can see, by default, SQLize creates a numeric ID column whose value is automatically incremented for each record you insert. For most models, this is desirable, but there are still many scenarios where it makes sense to create a custom primary key. One such scenario is that you are creating an articles website Instead of retrieving articles by a numeric identifier, you'll probably want to retrieve them based off of a slug. If you don't know what a slug is, it's basically the article's title with spaces replaced with hyphens and any other non-alphanumeric characters removed. An example of an article's website is median.com. As you can see, the title of this article is Misunderstanding ES6 Modules. As you can see, instead of going to medium.com forward slash the article's ID number, we go to medium.com forward slash the article slug, which is essentially the title, Misunderstanding ES6, only with spaces replaced with hyphens, and if there were symbols in there, they would be removed entirely. To create a custom primary key column, we must first create a column. This should be old hat to you by now. I'll go back to the code and create a new column called slug and specify the type to be sqlize.string. In addition to the familiar type property, I'm also gonna specify a primary key property and set its value to true. This tells SQLize that this column should serve as the primary key for this model and that it should not generate one automatically. And that's all there is to it. One last time, I'll run the script. Once it's finished running, I'll go back to Workbench. Let me close this tab real quick and refresh the table view. Now, when I look at the settings again, you can see that the ID column no longer exists and in its place, there is a column called slug. As you can see, it is a primary key. All right, that's it. Thank you very much for watching everybody. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a rating. And if you have any questions or any comments, please don't hesitate to leave them in the comments section down below. If you want to be the first to see future videos on this topic, make sure you subscribe. Also, if you are so inclined, you may follow me on Twitter or GitHub. My social media links are in the description below. Hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.